Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's discussion organised by UNU IIGH and the Independent Resource Group for Global Health Justice. The theme for this year's World Health Day, celebrated tomorrow on April 7th, is building a fairer, healthier world. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the many inequities that exist within global public health. But these inequities did not suddenly appear in 2020. COVID-19 has merely shone a spotlight on and exacerbated existing health inequities, many of which are baked into public health architecture at both the national and global level. Many have written about global health transition from colonial medicine to the global health we know today. Others still have debated and dissected what we actually understand the global health of today to be. Variously described as a notion, so the current state of global health, an objective, a world of healthy people or a condition of global health, and a mix of scholarship, research and practice with associated questions, skills and competencies. However we define it, we know that opportunities for systems change abound and that the time for this change is now. As the world strives to build back better, and as we seek to radically reimagine what the global health of the future could look like, it will be vital to ensure that we do not design a system that replicates existing inequitable structures. There's many different pieces to the global health jigsaw, an ongoing IIGH review of the decolonizing global health literature from 1990 to 2021 shows that discussions cover five main areas. The first is a general desire to decolonize global health. Within that, uh, people touch specifically on different aspects of the jigsaw to decolonize knowledge production, to decolonize the knowledge brokering, such as publishing, and to decolonize how global health is funded. There's also understandably a heavy focus on education um, as it relates to global health and the medical field more broadly. However, notable by their absence are discussions related to the broader societal architecture within which global health operates, for instance, on governance, accountability and ethics. And it's within this broader architecture that the decolonizing discussions sit. For that reason, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shridhar Venkatapuram, our moderator for today, as we explore the intersection of the decolonizing efforts and global health ethics. So with no further ado, Shridhar, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rule. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us. Um, and we are really excited this, uh, for me this early morning uh, to come to this discussion and for to listen to what these two speakers have to say. I'm going to start out with just saying a couple of minutes, a couple of inter, couple of sorry, a couple of um, introductory comments. Uh, it's very early for me here in London. It's four or five o'clock in the morning, so you'll see me stumble a little bit. Um, but what I wanted to say is that the this conversation, this discussion is being made possible by two things. One is that uh, the three of us, me, Shea, and Krishil, are members of the International Resource Group on Global Health Justice. And the group was set up last year uh, to do three distinct things. One is that it is uh, a group of individuals, of philosophers from around the world, who would like to help support international organizations that are responding to the pandemic. Two is to raise the global justice and ethics issues that are happening at the transnational level that may not be getting sufficient attention for a variety of different reasons. And three is to encourage public debate about the global ethical dimensions of this pandemic, but also the causes, the distribution patterns, and the responses that we need. And so as a result of doing our work, what we are pleased is that the uh, United Nations University Institute for Global Health is hosting this conversation and hosting us about having a conversation on decolonizing global health as well as the respect for diverse indigenous values in the world and how to reconcile these two things. In order to help us think about 
uh, these two things, both the values of each one of these and what happens and how do we bring them together. Uh, we have two amazing individuals, two people that I admire greatly, um, both in terms of their scholarship, but also in terms of their practical implementation of their ethical thinking and reasoning, which I find incredibly valuable and very rare in academia and the world of academia is people who are both scholars and practitioners. So first, we have Dr. Dr. Shea Avimbola, who is a scholar and who's also the editor of the BMJ Global Health and for over one year and more than one year has been creating a space for uh, the discussions on decolonizing global health and has been doing so uh, in a way that has been productive and has been transforming the conversation and the way that we think about global health knowledge production and the way that it's disseminated and what's actually discussed. And then the second speaker is uh, Dr. Professor Krishil Watane, who is, for me, one of the leading philosophers of indigenous voices on issues such as social and global justice. So I always feel inadequate in trying to describe somebody else's scholarship and work. So I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves and also uh, introduce the way that they want to represent themselves in this conversation. So how this uh, conversation today is going to move forward is that we're going to have first some statements from both speakers about uh, what they think is important about these two subjects. Then I'm going to try to moderate a discussion if it's needed at all between the three of us and between the two of them. And it'll run for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then we will take question and answers. And importantly, I imagine that there are experts out in the world who are joining us today. And so if they have things to say, I am, I and we are really eager to also just hear your statements. You don't have to hide them as questions. If you have things that you want to say, you can say them and we'd be glad to hear them. As you know, these, this is being live streamed on a variety of platforms and it will be recorded and also shared with a variety of audiences over time. So if you uh, have questions, it's worthwhile to put them into the box as well uh, and so that we can share those questions in all different ways and your statements as well. So with that, let me now uh, begin with uh, share. And uh, could you please introduce yourself and then also uh, take some time to uh, tell us what you think about this subject and how you want us to think about this subject. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rida, and, and thanks to the organizers for hosting us. Um, I am Shaya Bimbala, uh, as Rida introduced me, and I am an academic at the University of Sydney in Australia, and I am speaking from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and to who's held us and I pay respect, past, present and future. And I'm also a Nigerian who was born, raised, bred, predominantly educated in Nigeria. And, um, and my, my take on decolonizing global health, I think, comes from, from these two places that I've called home and I continue to call home. Um, I am thoroughly colonized when you think about it. My education is a very, very colonized education. Um, I often say to myself that, that I am quite I'm as Western, as a Western, as many Westerners are in, in terms of the Western canon and, and Western education. Uh, and it, that is often difficult to, to appreciate if all you've ever lived is a Nigerian life. So one of the things that I'm really struck by in the decolonizing global health movement is, is that it's a lot of the voices that you hear in the movement are voices of people like me. Um, and I suspect you, Srida, and, and Krishil as well, who have had the benefit of experiencing two different, at least two different cultures of, and ways of being and seeing the world. And who then see the, the tension between them. And from that tension, um, the, this uh, desire to, to, for difference in religious. Um, and I'll come to that point a bit later. But, but, I, I, but I think the first framing point that I want to make is, is that I don't, I've struggled to see the decolonizing global health movement as a movement. Uh, emphasis on A. Um, the, the, my sense is that there are many movements 
that find it convenient to label themselves as decolonizing global health movement. Uh, and I'll give a few examples. Um, there are people, for example, who, who want to decolonize institutions in high-income countries. So the UK, Europe, they want to see those institutions decolonized and, and reckon with their history of colonization. There are people who are keen to, to decolonize institutions within um, settler colonies like Australia and Canada and the United States and New Zealand, who, who see that what, what is wrong historically uh, and present in, in how they operate. I, I also find that there are people who want to decolonize global institutions, sort of the UN, World Bank, WHO, et cetera. And within low and middle income countries, there are people who want to decolonize institutions there. And as I began, I was educated in a very, very colonial way. Um, and there are people, for example, in South Africa who are very, very keen on, on tearing that apart, pretty much. And I've been struck by how, for example, the rhetoric of different groups, and there are many of them that I could mention, differs. Right? So, so when I'm in South Africa, I was in South Africa during the Roads Must Fall movement um, a few years ago. And what I was struck by is how in Nigeria, we don't think about our problems in those ways, in those terms. We don't use decolonization as a word to describe what South Africans were fighting for. We use other terms, we, we use other framings for it. But when you think about it at a deep level, we are talking about quite similar things. And, and I think for me, the most important thing to acknowledge in this discussion is that there are very many different groups and subgroups and subgroups and subgroups. And within those groups, there are different framings of the problem and different conversations going on. And, and I am really reluctant to think of it as a global entity with, a, with an overarching framework and overarching ethical principles that, that, that could be identified. Um, and if such principles could be identified, my sense is that they would likely be identified from what trickles up from these different uh, conversations and spaces. And there are very many of them. Um, and, and that's something that I've observed a lot in, in my work as an editor, that people come at this differently and I've, I've restrained myself from imposing any framing on anyone who wants to talk about decolonization. However you want to use the word, however you want to use global health as a term, however, um, you're welcome to have that, to do that to the term. And my sense is that in time, perhaps we'll get to a point where we can then make sense of what people have done or are doing with it. But I think it's far too early in the day to, to try and draw parameters around it. And I think that it's important to, 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 to resist the temptation of, of global people um, to, to assume that the only space in which this conversation is going on is this global space. And I'm using that word loosely now. But that there is a sense, I think, among people who hang out in Geneva and who talk in academic circles and speak in global fora like us, to think that, that the conversation we are having is the conversation. Uh, but I think that there are very many conversations and it's, I think it's our job to listen to those conversations and to recognize that we are very often marginal. And nothing reminds me more of how marginal I am in this space than when I talk to Nigerians about the movement and they just speak a different language from me. I recognize that language and I was speaking about talking to Nigerians, but I know that that language is different from the language I speak when I'm talking in this kind of space. And, and that is a constant reminder for me that, that, that we are talking about similar things, we are coming from similar places, but the framing and the focus and the goals and the temperament and the, and the logics differ significantly. Same as when I'm talking and thinking within Australia as a space, as a colonized space. That, that again, the rhetoric among indigenous Australians, it's very different from the rhetoric you hear in Nigeria or South Africa. But again, you can find the connections if you look deeply enough. And I think for me, the, the important place to begin thinking about this issue is recognizing that sort of that true universality of, of, of the space and to not try and impose a central um, doctrine or a central set of assumptions or a central framing or even a central imagining on, on what it is. I'll stop there now. Thank you very much for that excellent opening. Um, sort of set up for that. Um, and now, uh, Krishal. Kia ora tātou, ngā mihi mai o hā ki a koutou i tēnei kōrero, ko Krishal Wātene tō ko ingoa he uri no Ngāti Manu te heketu Ngāti Whātua o rākei me tonga e tūake tēnei i raro i te maru o te kūnenga ki pūrehuroa ki tānaki. Kia ora. So, 
Hi, thank you so much for inviting me, Shruta and Shaya. Um, that was really insightful, actually, Shaya. Really appreciate what you've just said. Um, so I'm Prashul Watani and I'm a philosopher at Massey University. Um, and I'm Indigenous Māori from the North mainly, if you're familiar with New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand. I'm from the North, Taitokero, uh, both sides of the coast. <clears throat> um, and what I really am interested in talking about today, uh, aside from Shea talking about the kind of um, how interesting and how diverse these discussions are about decolonizing global health, but decolonization generally, um, is that I'm really interested in the way in which uh, global health um, in its various forms assumes and imposes a particular conceptual infrastructure, both globally and locally. And the way that uh, decolonization, if we can call it that, we just have that as a placeholder for now, requires that we really unpack that infrastructure. Because the limits of that infrastructure, particularly in health, but also generally, um, I think have been laid bare, right, in, in, our, in our recent times. Um, and one of the worries that I always have is that there is a temptation and there's a tendency to merely tinker with the infrastructure. Right? That's what we see. That's what we see happening. That's why we have these long ongoing struggles in Indigenous communities to transform health systems, education systems, legal systems, that this huge, huge um, history and journey of struggle that we see is ongoing. So there's this worry that uh, we raise the problem, but then we just merely tinker with the infrastructure, because I think we need more than tinkering, and there's an opportunity to do more than tinkering, uh, because I think the underlying threads of, if we can call it this colonial thinking, have determined global health systems, priorities and patterns. And we need to be careful we don't enable more of that thinking in our reforms, I think. Um, and how to do that, I think, is one of the big challenges. How to, how to do that honestly is one of the big challenges that we face. Because the thinking that got us here, uh, I don't think uh, entirely can be the thinking that we rely on to find a way out. Um, and that, because that thinking ignores the full range of ways in which we live well, and the range of ways we enrich each other's lives. And this goes back to something that Emma said earlier about the societal architecture. You know, how do we ground that architecture in relationships and partnerships, real partnerships, real relationships? Um, and what is the role of local communities in that conversation? How do we create space for these communities and for their struggles? And how do we recognize the long struggles by indigenous communities? And how do we uh, raise a question about where those struggles go to from here, right? because it's not the end of the road. We have a whole host of other challenges now in front of us. Um, and how we, how we transform the global health, we can call it that, environment is, is one, of the, one of the struggles that, one of the things that really rely on local communities, local indigenous communities um, as well. So those are the kinds of questions that I think about. How do we create space in this conversation for local communities? How do we create space that recognizes these long struggles and where they have to go to from here? Kia ora. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chrishil. So <clears throat> I'm, my brain is racing at the, at the moment. and I'm just sort of trying to figure out how we can gently start swimming in this sort of incredible set of various ideas. <clears throat> if I can start, Krishil, with your uh, talk <clears throat> and your sort of questions that you're raising, what I hear is you saying that indigenous communities have a struggle that is long and broad, which is that uh, the colonial domination of indigenous people is so pervasive across all different kinds of systems, education, law, health, etc. that your concern is uh, how do you create uh, a space and a sustainable space that allows us to transform this historically dominating set of conceptual architecture aside from the physical infrastructure and and all these other kinds of stuff there is actually a conceptual architecture that's also dominating here and how do we create a space of resistance and transformation of this overarching thing and global health is one of many different spaces that you're dealing with 
and so I, by you nodding, I'm hoping that you that I haven't misrepresented anything, but I've sort of understood what you've said. And share <clears throat> what I heard you say is that um, that decolonizing global health isn't one movement. It's actually a, a, a collection, a convening, I think is the word that you used, of a variety of different kinds of movements uh, in different kinds of places. So whether it be kind of the ex-colonies that are still, in a way, operating like they are, and so how do we uh, continue this the process of their decolonizing, pulling back. There is the colonies, settler colonies themselves, who are still functioning in some weird way in that space. There are global health or global institutions that have been set up by colonial powers, and they're still working in that way. There are low- and middle-income countries who are ex-colonies who are still struggling with their issues as well. And so decolonizing global health is really all those different kinds of efforts getting together and finding some sort of strength in joining up together in a movement of something. What I also heard you say is that as you create a space you think it's too early to impose any kind of coherence or try to put, uh, to act as a gatekeeper, or to try to edit anything. Uh, you're actually just more about uh, letting people define the spaces and the terms themselves. Um, so I think that those are two incredibly powerful and important struggles. Now, there is a question here or there's two questions that I would like for you to think about and, and think about. One is that global health sees itself as being driven by science. And apparently science is value-free and universal, like physics, right? Physics doesn't change whether you do it in Geneva, in a UN building, or whether you do it in London, or whether you do it in Nigeria. So I'd like for you to think about, or help us think about, um, if global health is about medicine and science, what, uh, and there are lots of people who are, you know, who are very skeptical of all of this politics in global health, right? They're like, we just do science, and what is all this? So help us understand the universal universalizable logic of science and how that deals with global health on one hand and then also indigenous struggles on the other. Uh, or do you have a view on this? If you don't have a view, you don't have a view. But I want to just sort of say it, the, 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 the kind of way that colonizing happened was the spread of science, right? Is that we bring reason, rationality along with whatever religion, but science was the one of the dominating ideas about civilization, civility, and entering the global community. So what do you think about that now? Particularly, science is how we solve the pandemic. Who wants to go first? Either one of you. Shaya? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I love when people volunteer somebody else. It's like, oh, I really think Shea should go first. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Sort of the last the last sort of comments you made there, Srida, about about what academic global health is for, or, or what what knowledge production in global health is for and is about. Um, and just a quick plug, but I, I have an editorial coming out today on, on just that particular topic. And one of the arguments that I was contending with there is that if we think about the uses of knowledge um, in, in sort of four different ways, and I'll be very quick about this, is that there is what I call a plumbing use of knowledge, which is the use of knowledge within the dominant logics of a system to improve incrementally. So sort of how do you get a clinician to do better work? How do you get someone who does outreaches to do better outreach? So there's that use of knowledge. Um, and there's use of knowledge for emancipation, which is a more liberatory, um, activist-leaning um, use of knowledge to change the logic of a system, so, something that 
that seems fundamentally structured system. Um, and there's the use of knowledge for engineering, which is what a, a designer of a system, someone who sits at the top of a system, mm. uses knowledge to, to restructure how a system works. Um, and there's the use of knowledge by academics like us, which I call professors in this, in this article, sort of this reframing and framing and discussion and debating, blah, 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 kind of use of knowledge. And I feel that, that one space in which the, the global health uh, knowledge production system fails significantly is the emancipation space. It is that generally, as you said, Shida, that, that we think about our purpose as science, as conceived sort of colonially, sort of this physics, identifying universal, generalizable, absolute truths. Whereas in many instances, what matters for equity and what matters for decolonization, when you think about it, are those particular contingent, localized, specific truths in different spaces, in different systems, by different people, um, and, and living space for those people doing that work to learn without imposing a logic from a distance or from a colonial power on, on, on how they go about liberating themselves or, or how they go about solving problems. Uh, so, so when I think about this, uh, I, I'm reminded often again of how uh, limited the, the uh, when, when we set our eyes on the goal of liberation and, and improving systems and decolonization, a, a lot of the scientific knowledge to which we defer and a lot of the globalized pieces of hierarchy of knowledge that, that we sort of pay homage to are, are really inconsequential for the most part, but they get a lot of attention. I, I, I'm not sure I have a particular specific solution to this, but I think that the way that we've structured our knowledge production infrastructure just globally in ways that again, as, as Crucial mentions, um, influences how, how things then work locally. That, that entire structure needs to be turned on its head, right? So there's this hierarchy that, that needs to go the other way around. I, I don't think that science is useless. It's very useful. But, but for the most part, I mean, and again, the story of COVID-19 vaccine t tells us that in, in very instructive ways, that, that science does something. But what does the most important thing that is, is not that kind of science? You know, we have the vaccine. How do you get it to everyone? Right? How do you change the IP, the intellectual property regime that limits access? How do you, how do, you do all of those other things? Which are things that matter the most? Um, and for some reason, our logics of, of how we conceive knowledge production and use sees those kinds of knowledge and those kinds of spaces as really not important. Which, again, when you think about it, it's really, it's really strange and wrong and absolutely you know, upside down. And so I think, I think that if we, thinking about decolonization and global health and knowledge production, I, I think our knowledge infrastructure needs to find a way to reckon directly with emancipation and how you use knowledge for emancipatory purposes. And, and I, I still, I don't know how to do that personally, but I know that that's what we need to do. Good. Crystal. Yeah, oh, that's, that was so fascinating. I think you're absolutely right there. I think, um, Shaya, that you're right that we have these this more a bundle of ideas, if I can call it that, and that we need a bundle of tools, right? And we we are our toolkit is so sparse. And I was just thinking about the way in which I talk about sort of indigenous struggles and the Maori struggle in health um, has been uh, not just long, but it's called attention to the role of Maori in health, uh, called attention to Te Tiriti, our treaty and its role in this country. Um, it's called attention to institutional racism, uh, but also, we've seen the development of health models that broaden the bi biomedical paradigm, right? So, and one of the most famous is Mason Jury's Whare Tapafa, which um, requires health services when working with Māori to, or anyone actually will benefit from this, to consider emotional, uh, whānau or community and spiritual concerns as well as physical pathology. So there's this, there's this need to kind of, it's not, a, I don't think it's a question and it's not helpful to think of whether health is just scientific, right? And whether we want to undermine that, but broadening our suite of tools and broadening our, our concepts and ideas um, in ways that really make an impact in the world and that really um, uh, enable people to live well and communities to live well is, I think, um, where we need to head to, right? Yeah, so prior to this pandemic, there was this, um, I think, this very recognizable tension between a 
you know, a dominating Western biomedical paradigm and diverse local indigenous uh, beliefs, practices, and histories regarding health and well-being. Um, and so there were systems worldwide that were trying to reconcile these two things. So I was, for example, in uh, in Brazil, in Manaus, working with an organization that deals or helps with uh, indigenous communities in the Amazon. And there is a tension there between we have certain health issues that require urgent attention from clinics, but at the same time, we demand respect for our practices and beliefs and them taken seriously. And there were systems about parallel systems being developed between indigenous medicine and uh, and sort of also the, the Western medicine itself. And many uh, societies are trying to deal with that kind of tension. But here, this is, I think, something that's sort of slightly different in global health is that the conversation isn't just about Western medicine versus indigenous beliefs, but as both of you are pointing to, is that there is a global health architecture. And this pandemic has shown to us how that architecture can be brought to life very quickly. So for me, the pandemic response is about a handful of men who had met very early on in 2020 and decided how the world will respond, right? And they decided that this is how we're going to come together and we're going to respond, and this is how we're going to finance it, and this is the dominant principles of it, which is private... Well, so one is that this is going to be a medical solution. It's a commodity-based solution, and it's going to be financed through particular mechanisms because we believe that that's the the right way to sort of deal with it. So here we are a year and a half later, and as Shea says, here you've got not only one, two, three, but many vaccines, but we don't have uh, sort of a way to make sure that everybody has access to it. But the point... The one point that I would disagree with Shea is that its system has worked very well for certain people. It hasn't worked very well for most people in the world. But if you ask most people in the richest of countries in the world, they'll say, I don't understand what's wrong with this. It's working, right? It worked. So we got, we got science to produce the vaccine, and the governments are now giving us the vaccine. So when you say... Um, that we haven't take, you know, there's things that, there's all these other things that people don't think is important. Actually, you know, I feel as though that stuff is not important to the people that are potentially the producers of knowledge, but also the owners of resources and the and power, right? So it's the system is working and it's working just fine for certain people. And so it's not just liberation and emancipation but it's liberation and emancipation for certain other people that their you know sort of condition is not being valued right am i what do you think about yes yeah i completely agree with you that, that the, the the way the way the system is set up of course as someone said a system does what it was set up to do um so, so certainly it does look after the interests um of, of certain people and so when, when I talk about the need to, to reorient that system in a way that serves the needs of the other people for whom it was not designed to serve, um, that, that's really what I'm getting at there. That, that, that the, system, the logic of the system has to change if we, if we want to serve the supposed purpose of the system, which is global health. Um, yeah. and, and in getting there, there, there will be tensions. Um, and here, I, I, sort of looking back to what I began with, that there are different spaces in the global health, decolonizing global health movement. This is a particular space. This is a space of the global architecture of global health. Right? And, and within that space, there has to be that shaking up. Um, and um, just a, a quick comment related to that, that I found in my experience that um, the incentive systems that keep that system in place stop people from challenging it directly, in, including people who are within it, who benefit from it, who see how problematic it is, who wish it would be different, 
that it is so structured in a way that even those people who know it and see it, and perhaps even know how to undo it, do not have the incentive to do so. And, and that, that is perhaps one, one place where I see the role of just noise making, just this everyday noise making in the hope that one day it will give. Um, but yeah. I want, to, I want to get to the really, one of the difficult dark spaces in this whole thing in one second, which is I want to talk about the people that are essentially using in whatever movement, you're always going to find people that will use the movement for self-benefit or to manipulate it for something else. I want to hold off on that. But I'd like to focus a little bit just for a few minutes, and perhaps, Krishal, you can sort of address this point, is that the, the, the kind of unit of analysis, perhaps, with indigenous uh, equity and justice movements is all about local, right? So we want to think about the local. But I wonder, could you tell us a little bit about what role the global has to has to play in the in the indigenous value about equity and justice, right? So there must be a, a concern for global justice within indigenous communities. So how does this one reconcile this idea of local values and and sort of location but at the same time thinking about the global and the potential idea of uh, um, alliances and sympathy and empathy with other communities in other places yeah great question um i actually have been thinking about that a lot i just wanted to go back to what um Shea was saying though about um what you and Cheryl were talking about, I mean, it goes sort of back to this tinkering problem, right, where we, we, we think about, well, who decides how, how we transform that architecture or that infrastructure? And then, which is relevant to what you've just asked me, that's why we have a lot of skepticism in Indigenous communities about this talk of global, right, this global thing that exists. Um, because, I mean, there is this problem of, well, who's deciding what that architecture looks like? and what values inform it and what role we play as local actors. Um, it's really interesting because indigenous philosophy tends to begin um, in this deep attachment to place and to people. That's where the, that's where the philosophy um, comes to life. The relationships that we have that we've um, worked on over time and which generate responsibilities. And so then there's this challenge as you've, as you've said about well, what about when we stretch that idea, right, to different places? Um, actually, there are wonderful global, and if I can call it that, global indigenous movements where there's wonderful relationships across the world, actually. So I think there's a lot of room for indigenous notions of care and equity and justice that exist outside of these um, localized environments because we see them tra being transformed all the time. So I think... Um, there is a way in which those ideas transcend the local and they have to. And indigenous communities globally are, are aware of that because we do have, we have built a global infrastructure, right? Of indigenous communities that is actively engaged in a whole range of, of um, social environmental practices and they support each other. Um, it's, so it, it already exists. It's whether or not the kind of relationship can exist with this other global thing that we're talking about now that can include on equal terms and equitable ways and just ways, the voices of indigenous communities. That's really the question. It's not whether indigenous communities and their values can extend, but whether there's even room for that in what we're dealing with and whether we can build the right kind of trust and partnership. <coughs> to make that happen. Yeah, so that's an excellent segue to, <coughs> I think what Shea was, was saying and what I wanted to sort of talk about, <coughs> which is that <coughs> Alongside this growing uh, visibility of a decolonizing global health movement has come the centers or, as you said, loud noise and loud voices. Um, and so, which raises this question of, are these the, the right voices? Are these the... Um, best voices? Are these the appropriate voices? These questions about, um, and you know, like Krishil, you're saying, is that are they engaging in appropriate relationships of trust and reciprocity to create the space? So what do you think? Are these, are these, you know, decolonizing global health voices as we hear them today, 
Um, do you think that these are doing what we want from, uh, you know, better relationships between the global health architecture and the indigenous systems and people? Does either one of yeah either one of you can answer that yeah, question? Yeah. Um, really. See, see, what, what I've noticed in my in my sort of just being engaged, um, sometimes as a, as a participant, or, or many other times as, as just a, an editor or a, a spectator of, of this growing movement, it is something that makes me a little bit uncomfortable, um, and I'll try and explain. A lot of this conversation, as I mentioned earlier, is being championed by people like me. And when I say like me, I mean diasporans, like people who have come from different low and middle income communities, um, settings and backgrounds, and find themselves in cases that make them deeply uncomfortable. Um, whether it is working in global health agencies or in rich country universities, and sort of just realizing that, that this whole thing is deeply problematic and, and trying to find a voice and, and a way to speak up from those places. Um, and what, what I find uncomfortable about that is that to some extent, that's the benefit of proximity, which is that you, you don't get to see how problematic your thing is until you're inside of it and you, and you look around and you realize that this thing is messed up. Um, which I think partly explains what I was trying to say earlier, that the conversation has been had by those people is different from the conversation being had by people who are in, in their countries, right? So, so the framing is different. The problem ultimately is the same. The framing is different. And my, my sense and my hope, I think, in this space is that those two will connect. Um, and it's not connecting yet. But, but I hope, I'm holding out hope that, that when people like me enter into global spaces, whether as an editor of a journal or a professor at a university or a, a staff of WHO or the World Bank, and you realize it's deeply problematic, First, for many of us, is to fight the battle of even having a voice in those places. And I know from people's different experiences how difficult it is to have a voice inside those places. And how often their voice threatens their job and their livelihood. Right? And I hear stories like that um, informally from people. So, so, so again, even though their voices seem loud, they're also very strange voices. They are voices that under threat themselves. And, and I'm really interested in... In, in how those voices connect with the other voices, because I, I'm really, I think it's a problem that they are separate, but I understand this, this, this separation. And, and I'm holding out hope that the, the louder each one of them is, the more the, the points of connection will emerge. So, so I'm, I'm a little less, um, I'm concerned about it, but I'm not too worried about it. Right? That I, 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 I see it as part of a continuum, an evolving story of, of a movement. Yeah. Crystal? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to think that one of the, the major challenges for what we could call professional academics today is how to bridge that gap. How to, when you're given a global platform as a professional academic, how do you, how do you create space for, a community, for communities in that role? And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that we face of creating that space and trying to work in ways that create that space. Because ultimately, I mean, I think what, what we're doing when we do that is we render our own roles insignificant in the end. And I think that's the, that's the question that professional academics must ask themselves. How do we work in ways that, and work with communities in ways that we are not needed anymore because we enable them to, 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 to voice their own perspectives in the world? And I think that we need to start working more like that and asking those kinds of questions of ourselves and our practice. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I think that at this point, I need to shut up and sort of see what the question and answers are because you and I, all of us could have this conversation for much longer, but I'd like to give some of the people that have made time today to get their comments and, and questions in. So we've got nine questions so far and I'd like to encourage everyone else to type in their comments and questions because they are a record and they will sort of be around after this conversation. It's important for us to, uh, to say that. So I'm just looking at the, the thing. Um, so let's, um, 
let's i'm just going to read it i am not sort of uh editing it or curating it let's see what it says so from girija shankar i'd love to hear the panelists help global health practitioners with the question so what i worry that the decolonizing global health concept has already been co-opted by traditional leadership of global health in the global north and runs the risk risk of becoming another thing that the global north organizations do just like we've been doing health system strengthening for over 50 to 60 years now or is this still uh early days so um i guess the the question is uh how do we um you know how do we sort of you know what is our role here what's our so what role here um you know do we are we just observers in here or do we have something to act and to do here uh, as we watch these dynamics of as as Shea has pointed out the voices coming from some place there's also been this co-option but but really the point of this seminar is this idea of how do we not let this decolonizing global health movement start to dominate uh, the diversity of local knowledge and values. So what's the so what here for for us and, and the audience members? Krishna, let's let's start with you first before you volunteer Shea again. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's, I mean, you know, part of the challenge is that we're, if we're thinking about it just at this global level, right, then I think there's a whole set of problems that we have to face off, which you talked about, Trudar, who decides um, what kind of architecture is needed, what kind of governance system is needed to really make this happen. And we have, and we have to say a few things about what we expect of this decolonization ultimately then, right? We can't just leave it um, for too long uh, because then it takes on a life of its own and it might go in the wrong direction and the tinkering might happen. and um, that might not change anything at that level. But I think there's lots of, there's already so much work being done in communities, though, in local communities. I think we tend to forget about existing work and trying to provide a platform for that work and trying to um, shine a light on all of that work is really powerful. And yeah, I mean, there, were, there was work going on before the, the pandemic hit where communities were really getting together and deciding about health and wellbeing and about food systems and about the kind of collectives and collective action that was needed to make change in the world. So I think we, we, we can't let ourselves get down about the, the, the global architecture. We need to fix that, but we also need to um, find uh, a lot of strength in what's happening in local communities and, and not forget about that too. So a, lo so a number of questions are saying, give us the practical examples of where this has been successful. So do you, either of you have uh, places where you can point to or platforms that have been successful, that have been effectively transforming or challenging uh, the global health status quo and sort of promoting a, an emancipatory agenda that you would see as being both supportive of diversity of local values and knowledge, as well as sort of transforming the global system. I mean, just just extending the example crucial give now about indigenous communities, um, and and it's the same story in Australia that that for COVID nineteen, indigenous communities um, got the space. I don't want to say they were given the space, but they got the space to to decide how to respond and, and how to, to structure care and health systems in anticipation of COVID-19. And it's been extremely successful. Um, and, and this is, again, an example of, you know, there's this saying that if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to see, you did actually fall. Right? So a, a lot of trees are falling um, all around the place. Uh, and again, pa pa I think part of the, no the, the, the function of the knowledge, knowledge infrastructure in global health is to is to find these examples and make sure that it keeps resonating at, at a at, at a more outward facing um, in outward outward facing spaces um, because I think that these examples exist in many many places and and again just another example of um, of of the kind of of response that, that makes me sort of happy um, is um, in, in Nigeria. Uh, a lot of my friends and former colleagues who work in, in global health in Nigeria see and understand it. 
when, when we talk, and I can't out anyone here. They call it global health scam, right? So there's, there's a lot of language of scam. Among people who work in this space, um, and for me, I know it's going to take time for that language to, for them to be able to say that openly. But, but so, so when, when someone in the question asked about, um, uh, is this going to be another health system strengthening kind of narrative that, that people just, it becomes a buzzword and nothing happens. Um, I, again, I, I'm holding out faith that, that in time, those voices will speak out their truths because people are seeing this, this, this problem in different places and talking about it in, in more hushed tones. And I feel as though part of our responsibility, those of us who have this global kind of conversations, is to raise a level of discourse, such a level where those people can feel free enough to say what they have to say. Because I think, I think there's a lot of, of voices just waiting, I think, for, for that opening and for that opportunity to say it without being punished for it. And, and I'm, again, I'm holding out faith that, that this these voices will connect. Both the voices of, of those who are doing things that are really beneficial and decolonized in local spaces, but those who are also deeply disturbed and uncomfortable with how colonized their spaces are. Um, I, I'm, I'm holding out faith that these voices will, will trickle up, as it were. Yeah. Krishal, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just quickly that, I mean, similarly, I mean, in New Zealand, um, there was a recognition quickly um, as a result of the pandemic that Māori communities had developed the right kinds of practices that meant that they were they were well practiced in particular ways that allowed them to be to show quite a lot of resilience and and um, action in response and in a lot of ways they were really leading um, from the ground the response that that was needed at the time um, but also I wanted to point out that lots of uh, global agenda setting now is really trying to highlight the role of local communities so the human development report for instance but also the sustainable development goals you know they might not get it right yet um, but there's a real push to say that local communities have a, have a really central role to play in achieving all of these kinds of broadly speaking development um, goals that we have today and I think health could learn something from that the global health agenda could learn something from that too. Great um so there's so many questions that, um, so what, um, what I think that there is, there is a number of questions that um, speak to a particular aspect of this, which Shea has raised, um, but I want to sort of move to a different sort of transformation of that idea, which is this, that there's lots of different kinds of people that have been raising this decolonizing global health issue. But one group that you've identified is what you would call the diaspora. So the diaspora, by what you mean, is the diaspora, meaning the poor country diaspora who are living in rich countries, not ethnic diaspora, as in like the South Asians or the Nigerians. It's You're basically talking about people who have escaped, let's say, quote unquote, who sort of are living in rich countries and who are now saying, gosh, this is actually quite messy. Um, and now are sort of trying to figure out, so now that I know both worlds, I think that I have something to say about uh, stuff like that. So that to me is very uh, familiar dynamic, right? That's a longstanding dynamic where individuals that have been trained in, uh, who've become educated in a Western system, suddenly, you know, kind of recognize that they can, they can speak the language of the master and therefore now have a feel responsible to do something in order to transform. So that's sort of a familiar language. Um, but there's something else going on here, which I think is worthwhile. One is that we have people who are, who have been mobile, who have crossed gender, uh, sexuality, class, geography, these lines, and then are essentially trying to understand what is the right thing for me to do now, given that I see what I see and what I feel about equity and justice. What is my role here? And the decolonizing global health movement is a, is a way to express that kind of discomfort with knowing you know both sides of the of the worlds or something like that and where it is that's one 
But this is why philosophy and ethics is important is because there is a genuine question for people like this to say, what is the right thing for me to do? Like, that's a question, right? There's some, as we know, who are transforming this into a self-interested project is how can I ride this for my own benefit by using this? And then there's some people who are really scared because they're vulnerable in this position. Um, but this leaves open the question, what is the right thing for these kinds of people to do? Um, so we know, I mean, the question about if you are, you know, from the North and you've, you know, you are historically privileged and what is your responsibility? That's a different question that I want to leave aside. But what do you say to these people who are multiple, have multiple, you know, worlds that they live in? Uh, and here is this project about liberation that's in front of them. What do you think they should be doing? And both of us, all three of us are in those kinds of positions, right? The, the answer for me, just to jump in, is, is I, I don't know. Um, I, I can only speak for myself, um, which, which is a cop out in, in a way, but, but it's, that, that's the only person I know enough. I, I, and I think part, part of the, the, the way that I think about people like me is that it's hard to know where a person's head is without having been in that person's head. Um, so for example, I have lived more than three quarters of my life in Nigeria as a Nigerian only. Um, and, and so my, my, the values and tensions and experience I bring to, to the field and work that I do is very, very Nigerian. Um, but I also understand that, that person, another person who looks very much like me um, and has very similar biography could, be, could have zero experience of Nigeria or could, have, could, could feel differently about this. So, so, so for me, I'm, I'm really reluctant to, to ascribe intent um, to, to a person based on where they live or what they look like or what their nationalities are. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's complex and it's, it's, it's a field, uh, it, it's, it's an endeavor that, that where you have to make a lot of assumptions and, and a lot of that could be problematic. So, so I really, I'm reluctant and I hold back from, from making any judgments of, of people and just try to take it, what have they said? Do I trust what I've heard? Um, is, are, are, they, are they, in a sense, endangering their position? Because for me, that, that is perhaps one of those tests that I have in my head. That is this person uh, uh, reinforcing their position or endangering it. The, the, more, the more risk I, I feel the person is taking, the more inclined I am to take them seriously. <laughs> Interesting. That's a good. That's a good solution. That's an interesting. So, uh, Krishil, I'm going to give you 30 seconds because we are in the last two minutes, um, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Rule to come back on the screen to say goodbye uh, as we finish up. But go ahead. What, what's your? The only thing I would add. I mean, great answer, Shaya. Um, is that usually um, for Indigenous communities, we we often because it's community focused, we often say, well, you know, often we think, what's the right thing for me to do? How should I act? Well, actually maybe the way into that is to ask yourself what what relationships have you got that that are supportive what uh, communities do you have access to that might uh, provide space for you to engage in the appropriate ways the ways that you feel comfortable it's always it's always about relationships and community and I think people feeling not alone in this space is really important and I think if we can start thinking about um, the communities that exist that can nurture us and um, uh, enable us to uh, act in the appropriate ways for us and that, that are comfortable for us, I think that's that's the answer. That's the answer I would give people. So <clears throat> my answer uh, is, is basically for me is that I think your capacity determines what the right thing for you to do is, what you're capable of. If you're capable of having a global conversation, then you're, what the right thing for you to do is about whether that you can do that or not. Uh, and if you're very locally constrained, then your right thing to do depends on what you're able to do in that local level. So something to leave that uh, all of you with. With that, I want to say thank you very much to all of you for this really interesting and hopefully just a starting conversation uh, that brings out uh, stuff. So I'm going to hand it over back to uh, UNU IIGH. Well, thank you everybody for what has been a truly fascinating conversation. Um, as always, it makes me think it would be great to have more time so we could dig deeper into some of the really interesting topics and to answer some of the questions that we didn't get to today. Um, but I really do hope that everybody who's joined us today will continue to say, stay engaged, 
in the conversations, both with IIGH, um, within the Group for Global Health, or across the work coming out of the Group for Global Health Justice, and all the different platforms um, that we've mentioned today. I think just a, a quick reflection from me, it's, I think, really important for us geographically based in Malaysia, we straddle time zones that allow us to have conversations with people within the Southeast Asia, Asia region, but also across and south to Australia and New Zealand, and hopefully to capture some of our colleagues um, across the Middle East and Africa as well. Um, I know it's a bit early for Europe. Um, and the reason I think that's important is because this is supposed to be a global conversation. And there's a real risk that we end up having siloed conversations because of the time zones that we're in. Um, and there is really rich learnings as Kushil has pulled pointed out from many of the indigenous communities and former um, colony, colonial settlements. Um, and so I think it's really important that we're linking and learning across all of these. And so on that, again, thank you, our fantastic panelists for joining us. Thank you, our audience for being with us today. Um, as you know, this has been live streamed. The video will be available on the IIGH YouTube channel afterwards. So please tweet and share with your colleagues who might be asleep at the moment. We would love to keep the conversation going. Farewell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.